Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. My name is Lenny Esposito. I run uh, Come Reason Ministries, which is a Christian worldview and apologetics organization. If you've ha not heard the word apologetics, basically it just means to make a defense for the faith. Give good reasons why we believe the things that we believe. Now, if you want to check me out, get a hold of me on any type of social media or things like that, um, I'm pretty much all over the place and pretty consistent, just Come Reason, so whatever you'd, you'd like to do there. Um, today, though, we're going to be talking about Christianity, race, and human dignity. And I think these are really clearly important topics. And I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about this. These are the gladiatorial games. This is the culture in which Christianity was birthed, Rome. And in Rome, this was a hugely popular event. This was how Roman citizens entertained themselves, okay, by having people fight to the death for their amusement. Interestingly about uh, the gladiatorial games, the, the contestants were primarily subjugated peoples. They were the others. They were not Roman citizens. They were the slaves. They were those who were captured uh, uh, in wars. They were um, the poor people who couldn't afford to do anything else, maybe were, uh, had a debt to be paid, things, things like that. Uh, contests were fought to the death. So this is a big deal. It, it, was, it was good to be a Roman citizen because you had a whole lot of advantages, true advantages in society that you hadn't uh, been able to have if you were not a Roman citizen. And um, the shocking thing may be that after Constantine in 313 conquers Rome, 314 establishes his empire and basically takes Christianity out of the catacombs and puts it into the palaces, the gladiatorial games continued for a couple of generations until in 404 AD, you had a man from the east, bishop named Telemachus, who was an ascetic, and we learn this uh, from the history of uh, Theodore of Cyrus, Theodore of Cyrus, and Telemachus comes to Rome. His soul is bothered by what he sees as unchristian behavior. He sees the gladiatorial games going on, jumps into the arena, and says, these people are made in the image of God. These things should not be. Please, in Jesus' name, stop. That's 404 A.D. He says, quote, and this is what uh, uh, Theodore of Cyrus wrote, when the abominable spectacle was being exhibited, he went himself into the stadium and stepping down into the arena endeavored to stop the men who were wielding their weapons against one another. Telemachus was showing true Christian theology, was showing true Christian love, saying even though these are the lower classes, even though these are the pe people that you despise, they are people made in the image of God. They are worth every, but, every bit as much as you are. And that's going to be my premise today. Today's premise for today's talk hopefully is uncontroversial, but it is this. All human beings hold equal intrinsic worth regardless of their appearance, regardless of their physical abilities, and regardless of their mental abilities. That's my premise. Is that controversial? Have I said anything that's, that would Well, I'm glad that you agree with me. Let's, so we can all close up shop and go home, right? Racism isn't a thing. Oh, maybe, maybe we got some more work to do. Okay. Well, let's talk about this. Why is, if, if this is a, a, an uncontroversial premise, why is racism a thing? Well, in order for us to understand race and racism, I think the first question we have to ask is, what do we mean by race at all? What are we talking about? How does this work? What is this thing called race? And it turns out when you start to dig into it, our modern conception of race is something, it's just that. It's actually a fairly new idea. Um, 
cultures have traditionally had an us versus them mentality. I, don't, I think as we're human beings, we realize this. Uh, for example, we had the Greeks and the barbarians, right? Who are the barbarians? All those people who weren't civilized Greeks, like, you know, the good guys, they would say. Uh, you had the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay. You have the Christians and the infidels. Infidel is a Latin word, by the way. Uh, so that's specifically brought over. Unfaithful is what it means. You have the Japanese and the Gaijin. You have the Arabs and the Ajami. You even have the Amish and the English. If you're a part of the Amish sect, all those people who are not Amish are English. So this us versus them thing is pretty prevalent, pretty consistent among uh, humanity for most of its culture. But the us versus them that we're talking about was usually nationally driven. It was based on nations. In most of antiquity, the idea of race was tied to your language and your, and your local area. Basically, your culture was a, a very confined space. And we didn't uh, catalog people in large groups. It was very specific to who you were and your background where you came from. In the 17th century, though, that changed as science uh, started blossoming. We got the modern enlightenment. We had people who now want to try and classify things, index things. Uh, any of you who've studied biology know this name, Carl Linnaeus, right? Familiar with him? He's the guy that came up with our modern taxonomies, where we have genera and family and class and species and things like that. Linnaeus also wanted to divide people into specific groups. By, and now, he did it by continent. Americanus, Africus, Europeanus, um, Asiatics. Uh, that later became, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, these ideas, Caucasoid, Negroid, Mongoloid, Aboriginoid. Uh, these were the kind of ideas that um, early science was trying to use in order to group people into like-minded types. Now, when they're doing this, they're doing it, yes, broadly by location, but they're also doing it by phenotype, by look. They're using outside characteristics, just like you would use uh, to classify animals. They were just going basically by skin color, by uh, facial structure, by uh, the shape of your eyes, things like that. They were using to fall into these classifications. 20th century rolls around, DNA starts to be uh, studied, and all of a sudden we're finding that these classifications, these scientific breakdowns, really don't make a whole lot of sense. Matter of fact, um, the American Anthropological Association has said this, quote, they write, in the United States, both scholars and the general public have been conditioned to viewing human races as natural and separate divisions within the human species based on visible physical differences. With the vast expansion of scientific knowledge in this century, however, it has become clear that human populations are not unambiguous, clearly demarcated, biologically distinct groups. Evidence from the analysis of genetics, that is DNA, indicates most physical variation, about 94% of physical variation, lies within so-called racial groups. Conventional geographic racial groupings differ from one another in only about 6% of their genes. That means there's greater variation within a racial group than there is between the different racial groups. So you see where the problem is. And this leads people to say, um, this leads people to say that their, the idea of race doesn't necessarily have a firm footing in science, in biology. Uh, Ian F. Haney Lopez of Berkeley University notes that there are no genetic characteristics possessed by, say, all blacks, but not by all non-blacks. There's nothing in the gene pool that says, well, this is unique to blacks only. There's no gene or cluster of genes common to all whites, but not to non-whites. One race is not determined by a single gene or gene cluster nor are races marked by important differences in gene frequencies, the rate of appearance of certain gene types. So what he's saying is uh, we've got a problem with biology. There are no defining genetic characteristics that say you belong to this race because you have this gene and you don't belong to this race because you don't have it. There's no important differences in gene frequencies. 
And there's more diversity within a race in terms of genetics than there are between races. Uh, this led the United Nations in a 1950 statement to drop the term race altogether and to speak of ethnic groups. Well, if we're going to make race defined by ethnic groups, we have over 5,000 of them at current count, and that becomes 5,000 different races. Everybody's a minority at that point, right? You, you, you got a big problem. But uh, again, Haney Lopez uh, came up with a loose definition of race. He says, so what is a race? I define a race as a vast group of people loosely bound together by historically contingent, socially significant elephant elements of their morphology and or ancestry. I argue that race must be understood as a sui generis, that is, of its own, social phenomenon, which contested systems of meaning, so nobody agrees, it seems, on uh, serve as the connection between physical features, races, and personal characteristics. In other words, social meanings connect our faces to our souls. Now, what, do, what does all this mean? How do we put this into layman's terms? Well, let's, let's sum this up. Number one, race is not an essence. It's not a biological thing that is essentially who you are. We are all human beings. We are homo, homo sapiens, or homo sapiens sapiens. We are so much... The homo means alike. We are so much more alike in our biology than different. It, the differences that we do talk about while they are there are not significant to our humanity. So, for example, if I wanted to group people in a different way, say I wanted to group people by wealth. Well, um, people in California, I could say, on average, are more wealthy than people in Arkansas, right? And... The statistics bear me out on that. Have I said anything meaningful? Only in the sense that, you know, people in California are more wealthy than people in Arkansas. If I were to pull a person, have two people standing in front of me, one from California and one in Arkansas, and I knew nothing about them, maybe I could say, chances are the one from California is wealthier. If the person from Arkansas has the last name Walton, you know, the Waltons who own Walmart, chances are they're going to be wealthier than anybody else in California because they're one of the wealthiest people in the world. <laughs> so, you know, so even by identifying race in these classifications, you've not said anything significant about a specific individual. Race isn't an essence. It's not an illusion, though. It's not something we can just wipe away. We can at least understand a little bit about folks. So if you were to say, go to the doctor, and you're African-American, the, the doctor, not knowing much about you, can look at you as an African-American and say, you know what, your odds of getting sickle cell disease are much higher than, say, the odds of an Italian-American. Maybe we should check you out for that. It's going to tell you something because race does have a hereditary aspect to it. But the things that it tells you are not meaningful to your humanity they are meaningful to you, to your heritage, perhaps. And that's what we find out. It's a vague aspect of heritage, really. So race is part of our identity, but it's a, but it's a small part of our identity. There's bigger issues at play that let us understand who we are. So for example, what forms one's identity? The first thing is parents. Your primary identity, your primary understanding of how you fit and who you are in the world comes from your folks. You understand um, yourself through them because they tell you, right? Johnny, we're this. Susie, we do that. Um, you learn by watching. You learn by, uh, right? How many of you have met people and then when you meet their parents three months later, all the same expressions that they use in their language you hear it in their folks, and you know exactly where they came from. So we, um, we learn it from our parents. We learn it from our traditions. The things that we do, the, the celebrations that we hold, the way we treat family, for example. Uh, the uh, Spanish cultures, the Latin cultures, have a much stronger family tie, say, than uh, the uh, average English cultures. Caucasians that we see, and, and to, the, to the detriment of, of white folks, they, they tend to just, you know, we want to just put our folks in an old home and not worry about them, and that's, that's hideous, but our traditions, our, our, our uh, 
ideas and celebrations. Our food, right? What's this? Tamales. <laughs> when do you have tamales? Is it Christmas without tamales? No. Absolutely not. For me, I'm Italian. We never had tamales. Right? It surprised me when I learned. Now, being Italian, when I started working at the grocery store and the first time somebody asked for ricotta cheese, it stopped me in my tracks. That's not ricotta cheese, that's ricotta cheese. You know? so, so our food actually plays a big part in defining who we are, right? Oh, you, you know, bring the granddaughter over, right? My mom wants, wants me to bring my granddaughter over. They want to make, she makes fig cookies every Christmas. So we have to do that. We have to pass on the traditions. We have, and, and the food plays a big part of that. Uh, also, of course, your appearance does affect your identity. And where do you get your appearance from? It's, it's hereditary. You see yourself in your parents. You see the same blue eyes. You see the same nose structure, whatever the case may be. This is why um, people who are adopted or uh, children of sperm donors, for example, will go on long quests trying to find their natural parents because they want to understand better who they are and where they come from. And a lot of times when they find these people and they see someone that looks just like them, it's a shocking thing because they see that. Lastly, there's a shared history that helps define who you are, right? You look upon the people and the achievements in the past that say the people of your community or your country have done. And uh, you recognize those. And they also help us understand who we are and the fact that we can be successful as they were successful. So this is all what forms one identity, one's identity. Race has a little bit to do with all of this, but not as much as these things individually. These are more important, I would argue, even than race when you're starting to talk about self-identity, <coughs> right? I mean, you can make a racial epithet. You talk about my mama, it's a whole, whole different <laughs> level, right? You, know, you, you, you come up with your friend, hey, no mamas. We don't, we, yeah. <laughs> we don't do that here, yeah. Okay, so if race is part of your identity, but not the most important part, what is the Christian position on race? Well, the Christian position on race has been very, very clear. It is the equality of all human beings. And it's been very, very quite clear since its very first day. The, human, the unity of humanity in Christ has existed since Christianity day one. This is Christianity day one, Acts chapter two. Holy Spirit descends upon the believers waiting, who Christ told to wait. What's the first thing they do? They spill out into Jerusalem. And the book of Acts says this, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the sound of that Holy Spirit falling, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing the apostles speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, quote, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? In other words, they're from that race, that area. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthenians, Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So the very first act of the Holy Spirit to start the church was something multicultural. From every, right, you have, in this list, you have every color under the rainbow represented. You've got people from Asia, Africa, all over the place. And that has been the Christian message since its inception. Now, Paul goes further and says, as you're a Christian, the bond that you have with one another as individuals supersedes race in every way. He writes in 1 Corinthians 19, 20, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of that one spirit. Galatians 3, 28, Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all, all one in Christ Jesus. This is the most inclusive statement that says it doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. And it doesn't matter your sex. 
We are all one. We're human beings belonging to the human family. And in Colossians 3.11, here there is not Greek or, and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. So the Christian position on race is that race does nothing to damage or confer human, humanity on the individual. You are worthwhile. You are, have intrinsic worth. Now, why do we have intrinsic worth? And the answer that is clear in Christian theology and is what we call the Imago Dei, the image of God. Each one of us bears something that's equal. Now, if we look at it from a purely physical position or a biological position or even in a mental position, we're not all equal. Believe it or not, I've never been the tallest guy in my class. I do want to try and travel to Japan sometime because I want to see what it's like to be the tallest guy in the room. <laughs> but I've never had that opportunity. People ask me if I play basketball. I say, no, I kept hitting my head on the rim. It was ugly. <laughs> um, that's not true. But um, people are smarter than me. People are better looking than me. People are more athletic than me. People are richer than And any way you want to compare me to somebody else, materially, physically, or mentally, there's someone who's going to beat me, right? In a Darwinian sense, survival of the fittest would mean I'm probably not the most fit. However, all individuals have the image of God in equal measure. In other words, we all bear something that makes us different in kind from, say, the animals. Modern biology will say we're different in degree from the animals. That's not true. We are different in kind. There's something in us that's completely separate and unique from, say, a chimpanzee or an orangutan. And that is we have the ability to, A, recognize the spiritual. We can understand God. We can understand one another's minds. We understand that there's another person who can think, and we can project into the future. And we can reason. We can be thoughtful. We can use abstract thought to come to a conclusion that no other living thing uh, on earth can do. The image of God allows us to be rational. The image of God allows us to appreciate beauty for its own sake. The image of God is the thing that allows us to be civilized, to not react to our instincts, right? That's what being civilized is. I mean, people always point to me about bonobo chimps and things like that. I think, really? Those, they're some of the most sexually, uh, you know, predacious animals on the planet. I don't want to be that. Mm -hmm. People, when they ask me about sexuality and things like that, well, you know, they'll say, well, well, it doesn't bother dogs. They said, yeah, but I don't want someone coming over to my house and start humping me on the leg either. I mean, just, <laughs> this is, we are human beings. We are not animals. We don't follow instincts. We follow reason and rationality. It is the thing that makes us all equal. It is the Imago Dei. And whether we have been impaired in some way, even mentally, we don't, that doesn't diminish the Imago Dei. It's just blocked. It's just not necessarily able to be communicated, perhaps. But the Imago Dei, the image of God in all human beings, exists. And that's what makes us different. Now, because of that, the Christian position on race is we need to work towards equality. And this, if you've ever studied the history of Christianity, you know this has always been the way Christianity has been approached. From the ancient times in Rome, where crippled children were discarded on the banks of the Tiber, and the Christians would come and scoop them up. And you've got to remember, you've got to think about how, how this society works. Every mouth that you, every child that you bore, they were an able-bodied male, that was money in the bank, because that was an extra farmhand. That was somebody who could help out with the family business. But every child that you bore who couldn't help, who was somehow injured or debilitated, was a liability. It was a mouth you had to feed who couldn't contribute to the family coffers. And by the way, women were at that point considered a little bit of a liability because you had to pay a dowry, right? And they, they couldn't do necessarily as much as men. So 
Romans would abandon their kids on the side of the river, and Christians would come and scoop them up because they recognize the image of God is in this individual, and he doesn't deserve, or she doesn't deserve, to be abandoned and died. So the first orphanages were started by Christianity. Later, you get someone like William Wilberforce, who in the British Parliament fought for over 20 years against overwhelming uh, negative uh, antagonistic antagonists uh, in order to abolish the slave trade in Britain. And three days before his death, slavery was made illegal. Uh, although he abolished the, the trade of slavery some years prior to that, actual slavery as, it, as a practice itself was abolished three days before his death. 20 years, it cost him. Now, he was a gentleman. He was an English aristocrat. And it was, it was at his own personal um, um, risk that he and his friends did these things. 20-year crusade. Now, slavery wasn't the only issue that troubled 19th century British Christians. Between 1780 and 1844, they found at least 223 different religious, moral, educational, and philanthropic institutions dealing with everything from child abuse to poverty, poverty to illiteracy and other social ills. They covered, they, they showed that Christian charity in broader ways, but specifically for slavery, William William Force is a, is a key person. This is an actual photograph of Father Damien, who is a very famous uh, missionary priest uh, who was a missionary to the islands of Hawaii before it was, um, you know, highly settled. A matter of fact, in, in this time, in the late 1800s, um, there was a leper colony on, in Molokai because the Hawaiians didn't, you know, leprosy was in, very contagious. And so they shunned them all off. They would put them in Molokai, and they were treated kind of the way you would treat slaves or anything else, just that they were the untouchables, right? And you just throw them off to an island and don't let them worry about anything by themselves. Uh, Father Damien had the same reaction as Telemachus. He says, no, these are individuals that are people bearing the image of God, and they shouldn't be treated this way. So he went and he started ministering to them. He built houses. He gave them church services. He helped them crops. He advocated for them in government. Until uh, one day when he was making his cup of tea, he noticed that the hot water that was boiling from the pot as he poured it some of it splashed out and hit him in the foot, and he didn't feel it. In that Sunday sermon, he stood up and he says, brothers and sisters, for these many years I've come to you to minister to you. I tell you today, now I am one of you. And that's him in his deathbed as he succumbed to the ravages of the leprosy at the time. And then we have, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King based his civil disobedience on the scriptures and on obeying God rather than men. In his famous letter to the Birmingham jail, he writes, he's challenging church leaders, because the church wasn't getting it. The church wasn't with it. That's not a surprise. But he writes to the church leaders. They are saying, you can't break the law. you you, you got to do this the right way. And he writes, now what's the difference between a law and an unjust law? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. He goes on to say, that, of course, there's nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions in the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than to submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. So he points to the traditions of Christianity and says, this is what Christians have always done. Even if it costs me something, obviously he was in a jail, it cost Father Damien something. Oh, by the way, Telemachus, when he jumped into the crowd and interrupted the Super Bowl of his day by saying, you shall not do this, do you know what the reaction was? The crowd picked up stones and stoned him to death. It cost him something. But the outcry from the church was so great after that event that within one year, the emperor heard the news and abolished the gladiatorial games across the entire Roman Empire. So, 
the Christian church has always stood for the downtrodden. Now, my final point is, as I said, all human beings hold equal intrinsic worth regardless of their appearance, their physical or mental abilities. We need to honor that. We haven't been doing a good job in doing this. We should allow the church to be a haven for those in the Black Lives Matter movement who are mourning their children. Just as Father Damien saw a haven to those who are suffering from leprosy. He didn't say, well, you guys aren't really living moral lives and I can't come over there yet. He didn't do that. Matter of fact, Mike, Micah Edmondson, who uh, a black pastor speaking to the Gospel Coalition, was talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. I think he nailed it. I think he nailed it perfectly. He's, remember, the Gospel Coalition is an evangelical organization. And Edmondson writes this. He, he specifically said, Refusal to address the radicalized sin of the problem of, of uh, blacks being inadvertently targeted, shot, things like that, has undermined our capacity to fulfill our Romans 12:15 calling to, quote, mourn with those who mourn. The unique calling of the church, as opposed to institutions of the world, is not simply to tolerate one another, or even simply to understand one another, but to mourn with one another and bear one another's burdens, to deliberately devote ourselves to listen to one another for understanding, then to empathize with one another to the point of shedding tears with one another. That's certainly not what so many of the talking heads on cable TV and talk radio are advocating. They're not talking about mourning with those who mourn. But in the church, white suburban men are called to cry tears with a black inner city woman, scared to death that her husband is going to be the next Eric Gardner or that her teenage son is going to be the next Trevon Martin or Tamir Rice. And if you are so entrenched in your socio-political camp that you can't shed some tears with Tanisha, something is deeply wrong, because that's who the church is called to be. That's the kind of thing that makes our unity in Christ really conspicuous and causes people to see that there is a unique power at work in the church, unlike anything in the world. That's the motivation of a Telemachus. That's the motivation of a Father Damien. That's the motivation we need to have as a church, to listen to one another, to understand. Not to say, well, if you would only do this, then that problem would go away. That's, you know what? We are where we are. I was talking with my, my friend Elijah today over here, and you know, driving while black, that's a real thing. Almost everyone that I've talked to has had that experience if they're <coughs> African American. I've not had that experience. And I would weep with him for those things. Matter of fact, I want to bring Elijah up right now and uh, get his perspective. We need to listen to folks in both ways. Hopefully, uh, you know, this is kind of impromptu. He's not heard this talk before. So I'm, so I, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of springing that on him. But, but give, me, give me some of your thoughts. What do you think? Um, I think Liddy hit the nail right on the head. Um, first, talking about race, especially in Christ, because um, you know, we're all the same race as each other, especially when it comes to us being Christians. But there are differences that I think that we need to understand, and there's a certain level of grace that we all need to have with each other. But um, the Christian, res I think the Christian response is very important because the church shouldn't be looked at as some type of political party or some type of, um, not even a, cru a crusader for a social justice, but people who do what Christ has called us to do. And if we're going to be representatives of Christ out there, preaching the gospel to people, making disciples of all the, the nations, there are a lot of things that um, we need to not only understand, but we need to listen about. Because um, if we're giving out a view that, um, and typically, I don't know if you guys have heard about Lecrae, Lecrae has kind of um, spoke out against white evangelicalism. Sometimes we, it would be nice to have him define what that even means. Mm. But I think... And what he's talking about is what you see in the media. You have people in the NFL taking knees and all these things. Not necessarily the best way um, to um, go about the protest, but we as a church can't miss what people are trying to say by the way that they try to demonstrate it because um, we can get caught up so much in whether it's patriotism, uh, um, patriotism, however you pronounce that, <laughs> um, or and things like that, that we can miss the message. 
And if there are people hurting, um, like Liddy said, we should be the first ones to step up and be a sanctuary to reach these people. Because if we're so quick to say, um, the way that they're doing this particular thing, the way that they're protesting, or I don't believe them, and we're fighting against that, um, how can we preach the gospel to them? You know, they're already looking at us like, hey, the church is, they, they don't even want to grieve with us. I don't want to hear what they have to say about Jesus. And I think that level of grace, yes, there was slavery in the past. And uh, typically when I talk to uh, one of my white brothers and sisters, they're, they're understanding. But you do have those, especially the, those who are out there in the media, the main representatives saying things like, well, I, would, I never enslaved anybody. So, um, and, and it's true. And I think that's where black people, us, we need to, I wish there was, there's one black person. I wish we had more black people in here because I think that they need to hear this too. Um, Lenny Esposito, um, any white person is not responsible for the slavery in the past. And we need to understand that um, they're not, we can't hold them accountable for the things that they've done in the past. But I also think that white people need to understand that there has to be a level of grace. Like when you look out into black neighborhoods, or like my dad, he grew up in the 60s. My dad was hit in the, two, in the face with a two by four um, be, as an uh, act of you know, racial violence against him when they were rioting. Not my dad, but they had a riot at his high school. He's walking, he gets hit by a two by four. And this type of stuff spreads into the community. And, 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 and unfortunately, bitterness comes from those things. So I think just being aware that there are people who are suffering, not like understanding that I think when you look across the, the media and what they're showing is going on in these neighborhoods, a lot of these people are still climbing out of the holes that were dug by the, your ancestors. So I think there needs to yeah, be that grace point. there. Um, and like I said, where black people and other races need to have graces. Like the people that we are talking to have nothing to do with the racism that was involved. So I think that the level of grace, our representation of Christ is the most important thing. So love to take your questions, comments, um, open discussion items, maybe something you want to say, ask, share an experience. What do you think? Oh, and by the way, just, just, just so you have it a second time. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so you said uh, that quote from from the pastor that you quoted had mentioned that that you know us like as white evangelicals will say, um, or even people who aren't in that specific culture are dealing with the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's talking to a Southern Baptist group primarily, the Gospel Coalition, is yeah. Southern Baptist leaders. He's saying, you know, that we need to understand it and, and we put those in But I guess my question would be, and I, I'm actually interested to hear what kind of what, you know, kind of everyone thinks about, like, how how best can I leave with, I mean, off, I mean, I actually legitimately cried watching one of the videos, and I can't, I can't actually remember which one it was, but I remember that there was a, a news report and the wife of, oh God, so I can't remember his name, but, and his child was there, and and he was crying because his dad wasn't coming home. And I guess, I guess I'm just saying, how can we fulfill that mandate in a way that's more than just kind of sitting back and crying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I don't, I don't think that's what he meant. I, 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 think, I think he meant reaching out. Um, you know, how often do we, do we go to a, call up a black inner city church and say, you know, can we go out to lunch and let me hear you? Let me hear the story of your congregation. Let me hear your story. Let me, you know, what do you guys need? How, as opposed to being in competition. How can we, as individuals, um, uh, you know, approach someone and, and even, correct, we don't even, we go to our own church. If someone's sitting in our pew, it's like, hey, man, Sunday, I'm always sitting here. You can't take my spot, right? I mean, that's, that seems to be, you know, but we, we don't even approach one another uh, in that way. And, and, what I've found is some of this isn't easy because it takes time. It's not going to be, okay, I slated an hour and a half to be, you know, uh, open and multi, uh, multicultural and then, okay, that's done. Now let's move on to the next thing. It's going to take continuing to build friendships. 
And just like good friendships, yeah, there may be aspects of that other individual that, that you don't necessarily agree with. There's uh, things that I don't agree with with my wife. But you know what? You work it out because there's a love there that supersedes the disagreements. And that's, I think, the piece that he's kind of complaining about is, like Elijah said, okay, take a, take a knee. It's probably the, the most recent and probably one of the best examples. Because what I've understood as I've heard from the folks who are doing it is here is a way for me to express my sadness, my frustration about the fact that people who look like me are getting killed and it doesn't seem to be changing. That's the message they think they're saying. And they know that a lot of people are seeing it because it's in the news. What a lot of white people are saying is, my son served in the military. These guys fought for a flag. That means the ideals, the abstract, the abstract principles upon which our country was founded. And you're taking a knee is saying, you don't uphold those ideals. You don't respect that flag. And by extension, you don't respect my son. So you have two different groups saying two different things, okay, with the same actions. Now, we can either sit across from the table and have a three-hour debate on which way is the right way to express this message, or we can say, as a Christian would, let's forget that. Tell me your story. Let me hear your pain. Like I said, we're just driving over, listening to your one, one, uh, one talk. That's huge. 30 minutes waiting on a curb just because of your color of your skin with your hands behind your back. Why? Does that change the way, you know, I would look at the same police officer? Heck yeah, it does. Does it make me want to stand with him if he's going to write a letter of complaint? Yeah, it does. Does it make him feel, and you'll have to answer this, <laughs> does it make him feel heard and accepted that somebody else gets it? That it's not just me shouting into the wind and because nobody has my skin color, they don't care anymore. No, it gets that too. See, this is what humanity does with one another. This is what Christian, no, let me rephrase it. This is what Christianity should be doing with one another. Humanity naturally, like I said, goes back to the us versus them. But we're not to be that. Race is insignificant compared to the fact that we all bear God's image and hugely insignificant. It fades away into meaninglessness compared to the fact that we are all one in Christ. And if we don't get the order right, then these little tiffs, these little clashes about how you're supposed to say something, really, they sound like two-year-olds bickering back and forth when God is going to say, what are you kids talking about? Get on with the real issues of life. Love one another. Awesome. There's a, you know, there's something about a Christian being compassionate and uh, all these tragedies happen, um, whether good or bad, um, there bridges the gap between um, who we are in Christ and the gospel to these people. Um, my cousin, he would look at people's posts on Facebook, and Facebook is probably the worst yeah. place. That, <laughs> yeah. Or social media is some of the, where a lot of this junk goes down, where someone gets shot, and the first thing that someone will say is like, well, you know, this guy, he, would, he, he did something or he had a criminal record, so he deserved to die. And these are Christians saying that. Mm -hmm. When first we should grieve, I mean, even David, who grieved yeah. when Saul died, which is amazing because Saul was trying to kill him. And I think that's the heart that we need to have is grieve with those who grieve. We can, get to, we can debate about the facts later, but I think our initial response will be, should be something, it should be compassionate and something that can point people to Christ and not ruin our witness. Because if we're out there, what if Colin Kaepernick walked into the church and people were like, you took the knee, you started all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you just blew your opportunity to witness and reflect yeah. Christ to him. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we do that if we're constantly, the first thing we're doing is trying to um, argue our view that doesn't even have any eternal value. You know, and I think we should start take, looking at these issues 
from a sense where, or from a standpoint where we should be seeing what kind of eternal value does this have? Do I want to be right? Do I want to argue my point? Um, there's not going to be any, the, the only, there's not going to be any American flags in heaven. There's not going to be these type of issues that we're going to be arguing over, but guess who is going to be there? Christ on the throne. And that's who we need to be representing. God doesn't count your Facebook likes. Yes, true. That's a true Important debate wins. Any any other thoughts? I'd love to hear from you guys, because like I said, I mean, everyone's everyone is um, biased in their own way. Everyone has their own experiences, so they only have. You're only driving in our lane. We don't have the experience of these other lanes. And uh, and it, it, sometimes it, it's necessary for us to understand by hearing from, from other folks. So what do you think? Can you... Oh, don't be that scared. <laughs> Did Adam have a belly button? I don't know. <laughs> um, Elijah, what kind of books like, I don't know, it doesn't have to be a book or something, but like, what kind of books or, or a articles and stuff do you think are helpful to kind of help people kind of get how to, you know, build those bridges that you're, that you're kind of talking about? Like, who have you read or what do you like? Because, um, you know, I know there's different ways to get it, but just kind of resources for, for things like that. You know, who have you read or who have you well, listened to, like podcasts or whatever that you think would be good? Recently, I, I was talking to Lenny in the car. I did get pulled over about maybe three months ago. And, um, I guess I, I fit the description because I'm black, but he said the guy was driving a gray Civic with paper plates. I was in a white car, white Toyota Corolla with license plates on it. And the guy pulls up to the car, he looks in. He, he pulls up, as we're in a um, turning lane. He drives by all the cars and he backs up and he waits. And we got over there, he pulled me over. To make a long story short, he completely pat me down, violated me, search my car. I was trying to be a good Samaritan. I said, yeah, go ahead and search my car. I'm looking high. Um, had me there in the, in the summer like this on the curb. It was so humiliating. But um, because I had listened to this podcast from, um, it was Jay Warner Wallace, and he was a, um, 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 he's a crime, a crime scene. Oh, yeah, yeah cold, cold case, case detective. He's detective. a detective out of Torrance. Um, and he gave a kind of a police uh, perspective of things when I was able to have grace so um, I would just if you guys especially like we need to be having conversations with other people and hearing their stories and I think the best way to do that is to listen to what someone is saying before we even think about uh, giving our opinion hear them out and sometimes it's hard for people to see uh, what goes on and even understand that like there are people I can tell about different experiences and they may not even believe you. But if you could just listen to people and how they feel and where they're coming from, I think that's the most helpful thing besides looking at certain resources and things, but actually listening to people's stories. If you ever go into uh, San Bernardino, because I grew up in San Bernardino, not the north end, this is like the good part. But <laughs> The, the middle and the hoods and stuff like that, and you start hearing some of the stories and how people have been treated, um, you'll, you'll see a big thing. People wonder why, like almost everybody today, even black people, think, okay, OJ probably murdered Nicole. <laughs> and, um, and, and there's controversy with that. We don't, we don't know for sure, but back in those days, the reason why there was such a split is because those stories that they told about this a uh, heroic officer finding the bloody glove and him being a racist, people identified with that because there was so much police brutality going on in the different neighborhoods that that was very believable. Like you can hear that story and say yes because I've been harassed by the police so I know they're very capable of doing that. And it changed the perspective. That's why there was a split so a lot of people didn't understand. They're like well all the evidence points to this but the people who have gone through it, a lot of the black communities who have experienced these things, they were like, I don't, like, all I see is corruption in the police department, so I don't believe anything that they say. 
Mm-hmm. And I think when you start to understand that there is a different life experience there, um, you may not be able to understand in the sense that you know what they're going through, but you hear the stories and actually take them serious. I think that helps us to be able to uh, reach out to each other. Mm-hmm. And stuff, so. Yeah, that's good. Yes, sir. Um, how can we communicate effectively to perhaps like some white Christians or people, Christians who are pessimistic to the idea of like engaging with um, like, you know, black communities and things like that? Um, I, well, I would, I would first ask why. I mean, I, I mean the three scriptures that I offered uh, earlier show that there's a clear biblical mandate that race shouldn't be a thing. And, and that, that our Christian love needs to supersede any of our differences. Um, but if they're that resistant, then they're sinning. I mean, you know, some, it's, it's just like anything else. Uh, you, you want to understand, if I talk to an atheist, okay, they're not, they're not necessarily going to say, oh, yes, tell me more about Christianity, maybe I'll believe. They're usually antagonistic toward it. But what I tend to do is, I, first of all, I want to talk about them. And I want to understand them and their perspective. Uh, that's first. I, I take what, and I was, said this before, I take what's called the second grade class photo approach. You guys remember the second, your second grade class photo? 30 kids all lined up, teacher on each end, remember those? And remember when they passed out the photos at the end? First of all, you looked at your, your, you know, your portrait, and there was always one kid who made a face. Um, but then you looked at the, what did you do when you got that class photo? What's the first thing that you did? You look for yourself. Why is that? Because you're the most interesting subject you will ever come across. You're fascinated by you, right? So that's what you do. You first start asking, well, why do you feel that way? Do you think that race, and, and ask them these questions. What do you think race is? My guess is that 10 out of 10 times when you ask people, what do you think race is, they won't have a real good answer because they haven't thought it through. So you don't know what race is, but you're making judgments about it. Does that seem problematic to you? <laughs> you know, um, do you think that the Bible talks at all about sharing cross-culturally, about sharing? You know, do you think that Jesus was stopped? Matter of fact, he did something that was um, never done. He went and talked to a Samaritan woman. <gasps> Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And he, he, he called them out. He took the Pharisees. He took the, like, the, the righteous guys. And he says, there will be no miracle here, but the miracle that was performed by Elijah for the widow's son. And, there, and Tyre, if it would have seen the miracles that it would have done here, would have repented. But you guys, right? those are two Gentile cities, guys. Those are two traditional enemies of Israel. Jesus was saying, guess what? The Gentiles get it more than you guys get it. That was a big deal. So he called them out for being self-righteous. Um, now, obviously, again, you don't want to fight. But you want to ask them, tell me why. Tell me what your reasoning is. Tell me why you don't think it'll work. Do you, do you, do you think that these people can't, they're not people? Do you don't think that they bear the image of God? Do you not think that they can understand? What are you actually saying? And usually, by that time, they'll, they'll have no good response. So, so then you can maybe say, well, let's go to the Bible. Let's see what the Bible says about it. I mean, that's, that's one approach. But you've got to talk with them. You've got to talk with them to find out why their uh, in, intransigence is existing as well. Right. And um, it, it really is about grace. And if I was standing in front of a bunch of black people, the conversation would be very different. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not asking you guys to go out, and, go out there and just, uh, you know, like, you're the only, like, people who aren't black are the only ones who have to understand what black people are going through. If I were talking to a group of black people, I'd be talking about this grace in the other direction. Like, these people, they don't have the same experiences that you have. And it's hard for someone to understand something unless they have gone through it. Like, um, my pastor, he lost his son. I can never go up to him and say, I understand exactly how you feel. All I can do is listening, listen to him, hear his grief, and then ask, how can I pray for you? And he can try to explain to it how I understand. I'll never be able to understand that. And, um, I, but, I, but because I can't understand, I need to understand that I can't be insensitive 
about um, what he's talking about. And in the same way, if I were talking to a group of black people, the discussion would probably be telling them that, look, they haven't been through the same struggles that you have been through. So when these people are asking questions or they're approaching you this way, you need to have grace with them and understand that they have a completely different experience than you, um, than you have. So it goes both ways. So it, it's hard to sit here and say, hey, this is how you should approach a black person with sympathy. But since you guys are here, we can say that. But on the other hand, if I'm talking to them, I'm, I'm telling them, you guys need to make sure that you're being gracious. A lot of people don't understand. They've never been through the things that you have been through. So if you can have grace, know that you're dealing with people who don't have that experience, you know, that knowledge experience, <laughs> um, we can be graceful towards them. And, and at the end of the day, it's all about Christ. It's all about being a reflection of Christ to each other. So it, as a black Christian, like, I see what Lecrae's talking about. I don't necessarily agree with all his methods. I would like him, it would be nice if he defined what he meant by like, the white evangelicals and pulling away from all of that and all these different things because I think sometimes we can become so passionate about an issue on either way that that takes precedence over us, our true mission, which is to reflect Christ to people. Like, my mission is not to go out there and be a black man or somebody who shares the black struggle with everybody. Um, my mission is to share Christ with people and bring people into the body of Christ and help them grow as a Christian. And I think that should be our main focus. But you can't do that without bridging that gap, without, like he said, the, the elementary photo and, and going into their world and talking about them. So. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Other ideas, thoughts? Okay, guys. Well, thanks so much. I uh, so appreciate your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, really about anything. Talk to him, <laughs> 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 I'd love to. I'd li that, yeah, it's kind of job description is what it yeah. is. But, uh, and next, I'll be back. When will I be? Will it be December? Is, am I here? Am I, where's Rob? Am I here in December? I think I'm here in December. I don't um, it, it, it depends on how the Christmas break works. But I know I'm back here every month. So... <laughs> And uh, you guys meet every week. Yes. So, no, they don't have pizza every week. Yeah. But maybe. Monday if you, pizza, yeah. yeah, there's more. There's more there. All right. <laughs> God bless you guys, and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for watching this Come Reason video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like these, consider subscribing to our Come Reason YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. And you can follow us on social media. Lastly, if you'd like to help keep these kinds of videos free, consider providing a donation by clicking on the donation button beside me. Thank you.